we're going to continue to lose value in the dollar. This Bitcoin thing is the opposite. It continues to appreciate its purchasing power over time. Why are you so excited about this? Okay, so I, I think about it differently, but we get to the same outcome. Okay. People use Bitcoin and they say it's a, it's like a currency. It, it's not. If everyone started talking about Bitcoin being a commodity, they would actually be talking about the freedom of Bitcoin and they'd be talking to people and everybody who's in power would now understand. What's up, guys? Today, we've got an incredible episode with Howard Lutnick, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald. Howard is one of the most interesting people in finance. He's a billionaire, and he has some incredible stories and ideas about what he thinks we can do to improve the state of America. In this conversation, we talk about the national debt, inflation, why he is the co-head of the Trump transition team, and what their plan is to balance the budget, and how they actually are going to turn everything around economically for so many millions of Americans. On top of that, Howard also was the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald during 9-11. They famously lost 658 of their employees, and Howard tells a very moving and inspiring story of what happened that day, where he was, and what they did to rebuild the firm, and how they took so much time, effort, and money to support so many different families who had lost their loved ones during that horrific attack. This conversation will give you lots of ideas about the future. It'll teach you about one side of the political aisle and what their plan is. And then also at the end, it's pretty heavy stuff, but you're going to want to listen to Howard's story about 9-11 and how Cantor Fitzgerald went through that time and came back even stronger. Here is my episode with Howard Lutnick. You are the epitome of the American dream. Uh, I think that uh, as the co-head of the Trump transition team, uh, the American dream is the promise of a lot of the policies. What does it mean to have the American dream today? Like, what is that? Is that still alive in America today? Well, it gets confused by people because uh, you see these politicians, they just talk about these platitudes. They don't talk about, you. what do you want to own? You want to own a home? You want to have a great life for your kids. You want to have a good education. You want to have your kids live a better life than you had, right? And that's sort of the fundamental American dream of, of our country, right? We have got two thirds of the American workforce does not have, you know, they only have a high school education, right? And one third has a college education. So two thirds high school education, one third college education, and the two thirds live, ready for this? Seven years less. How, how is that possible? It's not the air, right? It's not the food and it's not healthcare. It's despair. You work in an auto factory. They do NAFTA, right? Where they, and they move your auto factory to Mexico. Who came up with this idea? This is like nuts, right? They move it down to Mexico. They gut Michigan. You lose your job. Where, where do you go? So you're so sad and you're so depressed you take drugs. Then what do they do? They open the border and they bring fentanyl in, right? And it's despair. So we've got to fix it. And that's, you know, Trump's key mission is let's take care of the American workers. Let's take care of America. Let's take care of America first. And people go, oh, that's crazy. Why is that crazy? How about we take care of America? And so that's sort of a key part of his initiative. Now, did I think about this five years ago? Of course not. I was rebuilding after September 11th, but now I am just focused on what's the right move for America. And, and that's why I'm, I'm all in with Donald Trump, his policies, his thinking, his way of just looking at things, his intuition is just right. So one of the things that's been fascinating to me is there's a bunch of groups, uh, they're union groups and, and uh, various other kind of American worker, you know, type uh, governance or, or organizations that uh, are either supporting Trump or they're absolving themselves from endorsing either candidate, which is basically kind of an implicit uh, endorsement of Trump. Uh, why is it that these organizations, which historically have donated to Democrats, they have supported them, they've endorsed them, uh, they've been very Democrat in their voting uh, kind of penetration, all of a sudden are switching over. Are we seeing the political parties kind of shift and now the Republican Party is becoming more pro-American worker and the, where the Democrats used to be that way? Exactly right. So what happened is the Democrat Party, when I grew up, used to be the, the party of the worker and the Republicans were the party of the businesses, right? And that's completely shifted. Now, Donald Trump talks about 
taking care of the American worker, the union worker, the rank and file. And the, and the Democrats talk about the Green New Deal, right? And so they talk about electric cars. Who, who's buying an electric car? You're not buying an electric car if you're a farmer in the middle of the country. Electric cars don't work. I like a friend of mine, they're, they're so left incredibly left and they live in Chicago. They're incredibly left. And they said they were going to visit their parents, but, and they have two electric cars, but they had to rent a car because their parents live a couple hundred miles away. And of course the electric car can't possibly make it there and back. So they rent a regular car. I mean, what American worker is going out to buy an electric car? The answer is none of them. This is just coastal elite nonsense has sort of infiltrated the Democrat party. And now they just they're just out of touch with the American worker and Donald Trump has pivoted literally pivoted the Republican party to take care of the American worker and and it's really a fascinating change so the name on the door is not right and you've hit the point exactly it's really what's on the inside and on the inside of Donald Trump is let's go protect the American worker so one of the things that um people always point to is the income inequality gap and it's been widening for years and it's happened under republican administrations it's happened under democratic uh uh administrations and my analysis is that it really just comes down to the dollar loses value. The bottom 50% of Americans don't have investments. They just sit paycheck to paycheck. They put 100% of their wealth in dollars in the bank. Those dollars lose value. And the top 50% of Americans, they're not holding dollars. They're holding investments. Those investments go up and the cash goes down. Inflation obviously mm. spiked, which made that problem way worse. It accelerated the trends that were already kind of in place. Um, how much of the American worker is and the kind of their maybe uh, perception of pain or their uh, uh, dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with kind of their you know previous uh, political agenda is just like, I can't get ahead. Everything around me is getting more expensive. This inflation thing is eating away. And I'm almost a single uh, issue voter because literally I can't figure out how I'm going to put food on the table for my family. I can't figure out how I'm going to pay rent that's exploding around me. And it's just an economic story and everything else is just noise. Well, you, you hit it on the head. So inflation, right, changes everything. So when Donald Trump was in office, he had 3% GDP growth, 3% wage growth. So the average wages in America are growing 3%, right? And 2% inflation. So people were getting ahead right? They were catching up, maybe 1%. But, you know, when you talk about all of America, 1% is a lot because it's everybody, right? Then the Democrats get elected. Now, you, you know why they did it, right? They, they're they not in power during the pandemic. So they want to help. They want to help. They really, really want to help. But then the economy sort of starts to rock in the end of 2020. 2021, we're, we're booming. And in March of 2021, the Democrats do the American Rescue Plan a solid 15 months too late. They put $1.9 trillion of new money into the system and create inflation. I go on TV at the time, I said, 15 months, the historical norm for over stimulus is 15 months later to get inflation, okay? June of 22, <laughs> Fed raises rates the first time, and here we go. So what inflation does, you're right, if I own a house, it inflates. If I own stocks, their earnings inflate, right? If I'm living paycheck to paycheck, the costs of my eggs go up. The cost of gas goes up. The cost of my insurance goes up. I get crushed, right? It crushes the American worker. So that's why inflation is the meanest thing you can ever do to your people. Not to the rich. You're right. The rich people, but it's not the rich people have ducked and avoided it. It's that rich people, they own a house and they own stuff and the stuff that they own goes up in value. But if you're spending your money, you're just getting pulverized, right? Because it's, so the key is you got to bring great jobs here. You got to tariff the rest of the world and keep them the heck out. You got to bring the manufacturing back here. Sorry, I hit your mic. Right? You have to read. I talk with my hands, so this mic's in trouble. You know, watch out those punch back. Oh, that's right. <laughs> well, that would be funny, right? Imagine thing is boom. So don't hit me again. That would that would be funny, Mike. You'd be like the greatest podcast ever because you had the, the funny mic. But um, you know, bring it back. And what happens is if you bring back manufacturing, then there's you'd say, Well, how do you know there's so many workers to have all these jobs? There won't be. 
If you bring back American manufacturing into the great American economy and you protect the American workers, then there's going to be demand, excess demand, too many factories. And what's going to happen to the price of their services? Up it goes. What's fascinating to me is, I mean, COVID really was a uh, kind of a, a moment in time that exposed America for um, this pursuit of lowest cost labor, lowest cost goods. We basically searched the globe to find who was willing to do work for the least amount of money. And uh, what we were willing to give up for it was resilience. And so when the entire world locked down, all of a sudden America's like, well, what do we make here? And their list wasn't very long. <laughs> and so it does feel like um, cost is one component of this, but also there's an element of kind of a resilient story. And to me, you know, OK, how many times in our lifetime are we going to have a, a global lockdown? I'm not sure. Hopefully that was the only one. But then you get into things like national security. Right. I, I read a story that um, the ports in America, the cranes are being produced uh, in China. And there is the ability to remotely access them. And of course, the story is probably, hey, we need analytics or we need to be able to you know, uh, do software updates, blah, 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 whatever. I don't know. Maybe we can call China a, a frenemy. You know, we want to work with them, but also there, there's some competition that there's maybe some national security stuff. And so to have other countries who have remote access to the cranes that are, we rely on to get goods into our economy seems kind of like something maybe we should take a look at. And then you go and you look at it, a bunch of these other technologies that already have been uh, kind of put on a list. And America says, hey, we, we can't have these on our government officials phones. We can't use these in cell towers or, or whatever. Cost is important, but also it almost feels like people have forgotten how important it is to have uh, kind of a, a defense shield around technology and goods that protects the country regardless of the cost, right? It's kind of like you, you want low cost if everything else is held constant, but actually you should be willing to pay a little bit more as long as you actually are safe as well. So you're giving me like the greatest opening ever to talk about this stuff, but power, let's just talk about power. We all need energy, we need power. So national security would say that all of our states and all of our people need domestic power. We, we are a net exporter of power. But what we do is we refuse to build pipelines to get our own energy to ourselves. So while we're net equal, we sell to others and import from others. And by the way, do you think the oil that we buy from Russia, and by the way, if you don't think we buy oil from Russia, you're wrong. Do you think it's clean oil from Russia? No, I don't think so. So what happens is we cancel our own pipelines which really, instead of calling it the Keystone Pipeline, they should have called it the National Security Deliver Gas and Oil Across the United States of America. Instead, we cancel it because it won't go be green enough. And then what we buy is our ports are full of oil coming in from Venezuela and, and from Russia. And we buy their oil, even though there's sanctions, we still end up buying their oil because they go through here and there and it comes back in anyway. And then we burn dirty oil. So it's illogical. We let all of the pharmaceuticals like penicillin, we let the, the things that make it are made in China. And we don't think about the national security that if we had war with China, they just wouldn't give us you know penicillin anymore. Um, we buy batteries from where? Elon Musk complained to me that he has to buy his lithium to make batteries in Australia. And he says, where's the greatest lithium mines? Nevada. And we just found one, by the way, in Arkansas. Huge lithium mine. Why do we? So we buy it in Australia. And then he puts it and goes through seven time zones on a boat. That's really very, uh, you know, environmentally friendly to have a boat go from seven time frames. And it comes here. It's just hypocrisy. The worst part is it's hypocrisy. You really, if you want to be green and you want to be clean, which we all agree, we want clean water and clean air, but don't make believe that you're taking it from Australia and shipping it here and somehow it's green. National security matters. We got to think about manufacturing our stuff here, our pharmaceuticals here. We have to distribute oil and natural gas to ourselves here. So we are independent, not we're balanced, but 
half the people are buying it from outside and half buying it from inside. These are fundamental things that we need to think about. And that's the beauty of working for Donald Trump. He thinks about these things and he's the only one who thinks about them. There was a recent clip that went viral, which uh, it went viral because it was funny, uh, but it was Theo Vaughn talking to J.D. Vance. And uh, Theo Vaughn basically said some something like, uh, you know, the quality of goods has been so diminished that Americans are suffering. Now, he chose of all the goods and services in the world to use. He said, you can't do cocaine in this country anymore. Oh, right, right, right. right? Because basically <laughs> saying that it's, it's so viral. Yeah. Even, even a guy wears a suit. So you know? yeah, <laughs> right. And so it's like, look, he, he was making the claim that like even the cocaine is laced with fentanyl and, and uh, J.D. Vance, his credit just laughed and thought it was hilarious. And, and but I do think that, you know, again, strip out kind of the nonsense of the Internet and say, look, like, what is he really talking about there? And, and if you think about um, American made goods. Well, wait, but first let's talk about the fentanyl thing. You see, so it's slightly different than everybody thinks. So all the fentanyl comes from China. Why? Like what's the whole fentanyl thing? It's the gutting of America from the inside. You think they're just playing like a century long game and they say, we're going to rot your brain with TikTok. We're going to rot your population with fentanyl and we're, we're going to literally kill slowly fent- kill you. So that's what it is. Right? Why is the uh, why is the American workforce have seven year less average life? Because what happens is if they get despair and they take a drug and the drug kills them, mm-hmm. it kills them. So China is attacking America from its guts. You know, it's getting stuff in your stomach, mm-hmm. right? It's going to get it directly into your stomach to try to kill you, right? Because who's our workforce who might take fentanyl? Right? Mm-hmm. Are they old people, like 63 year olds like me? No, right? They're the 18 to 30 year olds, mm-hmm. right? So if I kill them, then where are you going from here? Mm-hmm. No, I think it's I think it's the core evil mm-hmm. that you really and people don't core they don't call out core evil. Who makes fentanyl? Their core evil. It all comes from China. Donald Trump gets in office. He calls China and says, "The next piece of fentanyl that comes in our country, I'm putting a 200 percent tariff on you, and your country must have our economy." Because otherwise you won't employ your people. If your people are unemployed, then there'll be regime change. You know, they'll rise up against the Communist Party. So stop the fentanyl and you'll watch it stop. And that's the person who saved American workers' lives. And then the joke will be, he can't do cocaine again. In yeah, yeah. Well, well and, and it goes- <laughs> Which is kind of a funny comment. I mean, it's hilarious, people. right? But, but the- um, <laughs> I think that if you watch the chain of, let's say, fentanyl, so you have the production of it in China, uh, but it's also getting into the country. And people have seen video after video after video of um, boats pulling up to the shores of America and 10 to 12 uh, you know, military aged men jumping off and running into our neighborhoods and literally just leaving the boat behind. They've seen literally caravans of people crossing rivers, borders, et cetera. Um, and you see all that and you say, you know what? The Border Patrol has got a really hard job. America's big. We've got these massive borders. Uh, We've got to try to figure out how to secure them. And building a wall seemed like a good idea. Now, you know, it sounds like both candidates are on board to build the wall. But I think the part that people then go from, wow, that's a really hard problem to uh, pissed off, frankly, in conversation I've had with both people on both sides of the aisle, is that the government then takes those people and flies them all around the country. And now all of a sudden, if you don't live in a border town, you've got those same people who are crossing the border now living in your city, living in your town. And so is it just a game of, hey, guys, we're going to stop the production of fentanyl and we're also going to stop people from just coming in the country that aren't legal? Well, the whole open the border. So Donald Trump had 10 miles left. He built 500 miles. He had 10 miles left. And all the steel is in a factory. He had 10 miles left and he made a deal with Mexico to protect the border. He said, I'm going to put tariffs on you, Mexico, unless you don't let people in. So the Mexican military was kept the border closed. And then Biden just ended it on executive order his first day. He said, I nah, open the border. Why? Why would you open the border? Joe Biden, when he was young, was all against the border. Bill Clinton was against the opening the border. What happened? I think I know. Tell you want to know what I think that happened? Um, I think it's there, voters. There's only one thing that I can think of that a bureaucratic 
administration could all get in a conference room, have a bunch of papers, studies, all this stuff, and come to the conclusion that we should do this for one reason. And it's because they looked at the economy and they said, we don't have enough workers. Let them all in. Oh, my God. I can't disagree more. <laughs> that is just such a load of crap. Sorry. No, no, no. Again, not no, that no, it's accurate. I completely and totally disagree. Because if you wanted workers, you would actually check who they are. You think the people who are sneaking into our country are ready to go to work? Are you out of your mind? They are ready to vote. For you whoever think it's for let voters. them in. All right, so let's go through it. The census. You know, I'm sure this is like one of the most exciting things you've ever talked about in your podcast <laughs> is the census. But the census does not count citizens. It counts humans. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You put them on that plane and where do you send them? You send them Places to where you the need them. swing states so that they'll have more people. The census will have more people, more congressmen, will come from that particular district. And then you'll figure out a way to fast track, as Kamala Harris has said, fast track them to citizenship so that by next election, these 20 million people they've let in, they let in 20 million people who vote for them because they let you in. Okay. okay. And that is why I do not think this is worker-based. I don't think it has anything to do with worker-based. I think it has entirely to do with a deep-seated view that I want to bring in and make this a one party country and all left all the time. They'll try to get, if they win, they'll try to get DC. They've said this stuff. They'll make DC and Puerto Rico states so they can have four Democrat senators. They'll break the filibuster. And they've said, and Chuck Schumer has said that he would pack the court with uh, with Democrats. And then well, let's talk about Chuck Schumer for a second. You Ch win. Ch Chuck Schumer uh, and Trump, uh, I've heard, uh, you know, they didn't get along for a long time. But then I saw the uh, Al Smith dinner and uh, they were acting pretty chummy sitting next to each other. How, how does DC really work? Like, is, is it a, um, you go on TV, you hold a press conference, you yell and scream about somebody else. And then behind closed doors, your friends, or when we see people arguing with each other, or, you know, talking shit, essentially, uh, they really don't like each other. It used to be uh, that people were very civil to each other mm -hmm. and that you had differences of opinion, but people, so Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg were great friends, right? Mm -hmm. So they had different sides of the Supreme Court, but they were great friends. That has dissipated. Mm. You know, what happens now is you blame the other one for everything in the world. I mean, Kamala Harris goes on TV and calls Donald Trump a fascist, says by having a rally in Madison Square Garden where I'm speaking and I'm introducing Elon Musk, right? That's, he's, an, he's a Hitler for doing Madison Square Garden where I'm introducing Elon Musk and then Elon Musk is introducing J.D. Vance and then Donald Trump is speaking and that somehow is fascist. That is just mean nasty and completely false. How did we get here, right? So like, if it has evolved to this point where everyone is just, hey, no holds barred, just say whatever you want, um, really go after, kind of now uh, some of you disagree with, is that the mainstream media kind of pulling people to the extremes is that um they know that that's going to go viral online and they're and you know just get the clicks or you know what is it because i almost think uh in a weird way that um the politicians if you go and you talk to a young person you say you know name 10 politicians the ones that they will name trump harris aoc you know, uh, uh, Marjorie Green, right? Like, like you go to these people who are very good at getting attention. And so um, in a weird way, I used to say that uh, Trump and AOC were like a, very similar, like much more similar than people realized because they both understood how to dominate news cycles. Mm -hmm. He probably did it even bigger than she did, but still they both understood like, hey, you can do certain things. The appearance at McDonald's is a great example, right? That was a talk of the world for 24 hours. And the guy spent what, an hour at McDonald's? Right. And so it's like, is that what's happening now is politics is basically falling victim to uh, what gets rewarded online and just the people are getting better and better at understanding how to make it work. I, I think that's right. And I, I think what's happened is the media is now all one way or the other. Mm. So there's no such thing as nonpartisan media. There should be. Oh, people right? have opinions? Everybody has opinions. <laughs> By the way, I, you know, one of the things I talk about is, you know, people think, oh, they're generals. You know, the military, these are generals because they have all their you know medals and stuff. But the fact is, they're just people. 
mm-hmm. which means they're either Democrat generals or they're Republican generals. So who do you think all the four-star generals are under Joe Biden? Mm-hmm. Let me give you a hint. They're all Democrats, right? Because what they're supposed to do is then if a Republican gets elected, they retire. And of course, being a retired general is not that bad because guess where you go to work? Lockheed Martin. <laughs> you, know, you go right to General Dynamics. You go get a big job for money. So what's happened is the mainstream media is because it's all one way or the other, it's just echo chambers. And to get heard, you go stronger and stronger and stronger that way mm-hmm. to get some attention. And then that's what you have. You have this giant divide because there's no place to go have a civil conversation in the media. Where, where would I go? Let's say I wanted to bring a good debate for someone on the other side. Let's go have the head of the transition of the Harris campaign and let's go have a good debate. Where would you suggest I go? You come right here and I'll make sure you both fight it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. But, but, but like, but honestly, I really do think that um, in a crazy way, uh, the mainstream media is being replaced in certain pockets by people online who say, you know what? I'm trying to figure it out. And um, my wife is a, a journalist and uh, she would tell you that over the last 10 years, the shift that has occurred from um, – Hey, people want to find the truth to now, uh, especially young people who work at these mainstream media organizations are essentially activists who are able to publish with the big brand behind them. And it's not every organization. It's not every reporter, but there has been this massive shift um, that I think is really, really impactful. One thing I want, um, maybe we can uh, uh, clear something up is I've continued to say that the national debt is one of, if not the single most important thing facing the country, because if you have a massive national debt that is exploding, literally exploding, I think there's almost $500 billion has been added in just the month of October. Um, that national debt only has one solution. We're going to inflate it away because no, neither, another, neither candidate has explicitly been promising to balance the budget, which we haven't had a balanced budget in this country for more than 20 years. You, right before we started, told me that's not true, that you're going to help balance the budget. So let's talk about, uh, one, is it possible to balance the budget? How do you do it? And can you and Trump figure it out? Okay. So I have to add one person to it. All right. It's me, Elon Musk, and Trump are going to figure it out. So I went down on the day of the rocket, right? The coolest catch ever, right? Megazilla goes in and catches it. I flew down to Brownsville, Texas. Right. And uh, I met with Elon and uh, we spent two hours together and uh, and I told him we were going to create the department Doge. Right. And he did exactly that. He started laughing and he was happy. He goes, no, no, seriously. And I said, no, no, it's going to be called Doge, the Department of Government Efficiency. But we're definitely calling it Doge for you. And he was just so like lit happy like he just thought it was funny and that's what you're supposed to do yeah you have the, if you have the greatest capitalist in america and you can make him happy that's, that's pretty good there's an article a couple of years ago that asked him uh you know you're a multi-billionaire uh but also you like memes if given the choice would you rather be a billionaire or a meme lord and of course he said meme lord <laughs> okay so I, he invited me over his house and i went to go see him in his house and what's the name of the street meme street <laughs> <laughs> and I have a picture of it on my phone of just to make me laugh. Because, of course, you know, you go to the street sign. I mean, how often do I take a picture of a street sign? But yeah. if you go to see Elon Musk and he lives on Meme Street, like literally they renamed the street for him as Meme Street. And uh, so I put out a tweet with him. We took a picture in front and we said, we're going to rip the waste out of our $6.5 trillion budget. Right. And we are going to then balance the budget. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to do it. All right. So this is this is the plan of the Trump administration. And here's how it goes. We have a six point five trillion dollar budget. We have four point five trillion dollars of revenue. Right. So taxes and all the rest of our money and the tariffs that Donald Trump put in that Biden, who he said bad things about it, didn't take off. Shocking. Four point five trillion in revenue, six point five trillion in spending, two trillion a year budget deficit on only four and a half. I mean, it's irresponsible if there ever was one. Our GDP, total sales, right? But you're not counting the price of the sale of a house. You're just talking about the commission, okay? That's about $29 trillion, just under $29 trillion. 
And our total debt, just under $36 trillion. We're going to hell. We're going to hell. But if you go to a financial expert and you sort of hit him a few times and, and get him to pay attention the right way, you say, what ass, what thing didn't I say? Because those are the only stats you ever hear. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one more. What is the balance sheet of the United States of America? What's everything we own and everything we have? I think it's worth $500 trillion. So then you say, okay, Howard, can you make a quarter of 1% on it? Right now, if all of your assets are a giant mountain of you know, palladium and, and gold and, and you can't move it and you have to just look at it and go, oh, that's so pretty. That's not going to help us. But we have land and we have minerals. So if we have 500 trillion and we can make a quarter of a percent, that's a trillion and a quarter. You ask Elon Musk, can you rip waste out of our, just, I mean, I'm talking waste. Like what are examples, right? Because I think people don't quite understand um, how inefficient, how bureaucratic, just how ridiculous uh, this is, and this is coming from somebody who, um, I forget which bill it was. Uh, I think maybe it was the, uh, inf uh inflation reduction act. Uh, when that came out, I went and I, I read it. And as I was reading creation it, act, well, here was, here's what hilarious is well, whichever bill it was, as I was reading it, um, they're talking about, we're going to invest in infrastructure. Okay. That sounds good. Um, but we're going to do a study that's going to cost $50 million to look at the impact on exotic plants. There was, you know, another $50 million that was uh, to study the impact of driving high. And I literally said, I have hundreds of people in the audience that will do it for free. So I saved you $50 million there, right? Then you go and you look and it's like $25 million worth of uh, cleaning supplies for the Capitol building. And again, these are only 25, 50, whatever. But then I start looking and I see we're giving a billion dollars to some Appalachian nonprofit who happens to be run by the wife of a politician. Right. You start doing, you're just like, dude, where, like, where is the money going? All right. So we'll, I'll, I'll give you one that I promise will make you laugh. Okay. And then I'll give you one that makes you, you sad and shake your head. So the Department of the Interior. Okay. So you tell, oh, what is that? That's like the, the parks. Okay. Uh, uses the most real estate of any department in the United States government. You say, Really? I mean, like a lot of office space? Yeah, because they have office space across the country. So why would they have so much space? Oh, each office must be one day's horse ride from the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and your audience is saying, no, no, that's not true. Oh, no, no, no. That's true. Who, well, who told you that? Well, the secretary of the Department of the Interior told me that. And I'm like... And then I go look at the numbers. You're like, stop it, stop it. They came, I mean, one day's horse ride, one day's horse ride. See, but that's that's literally 2024. I mean, think of things that make you laugh. Come on, mm -hmm. you go to the airport and there's the aircraft, you know, the, the air traffic control tower. The tower, because they build it like a little taller. Because they're what? Looking out the window? Are they looking at the planes going, Oh, look, that one's going to hit this one. No, they have, they have radar. You'd say radar. What, radar? Like, what was that, 1970? Yeah. We have a company that makes 1970 radar equipment, a monopoly, by the way. Of course, we always have to have a monopoly, who makes this 1970 radar equipment new and gives it to us because GPS well, that would be a challenge. I mean, you know how much it would cost us to put GPS in every plane? Oh, they already have it. Oh, I forgot. They already have it. It would cost. All right. If we put GPS in planes, all our airports would be three times more efficient. Three times more efficient. Why don't we do it? Because the monopolist selling us the radar would be really pissed off. And his congressman would be really sad that we modernize America. Someone has to have the guts to do it, to get rid of all these offices. And so you tell that to Elon Musk, we send more than a hundred billion dollars a year and lose the money accidentally. Now you might say, come on, Howard, someone switched the number and sent it to his pal. 
I'm not doubting that. We buy over $100 billion worth of product that we never receive. Or I'll give you a fun one. When we left Afghanistan, right? We all know those pictures of us leaving Afghanistan. And we all know that we left $80 billion of equipment behind. And if I ask anybody, all my Democratic friends, and I ask them, what happened? They go, it's so stupid. Stupid. 80 billion stupid. See, when I say it slowly like that, you know what's coming. Yeah, I don't think it's so stupid. If I said to you, let's leave your house and let's leave all your furniture behind. We're going to move and we're going to leave all your furniture behind. We don't want to take it, a moving truck. No, no, no moving truck. That would be clever. Leave it all behind. What's the first thing you have to do when you go to your new house? Buy $80 billion of furniture. No, no, no. You left $80 billion of furniture for the for your the evil people on the enemy. You have to buy $120 billion <laughs> to fight them off. Yeah. Oh, you think it was stupid? See, everybody thought it was stupid. It's the military industrial complex. Let's go over a little history for a minute. Why does Dick Cheney hate Donald Trump? Donald Trump hates wars and had in his presidency no wars. Dick Cheney was the vice president of the United States, convinced George Bush to attack Iraq, right? Think of the amount of money you're going to spend. And, and Dick Cheney is the military industrial complex, right? That's his family, that they own stock. He ran military contractors. I mean, that's what he does. So he's a member of that club, right? And so they we attack Iraq and we destroy Iraq. As it turns out, Iraq and Iran have been at war with each other for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So we kill one of them. And the other one is like Thanos now. <laughs> He's just free to attack the Western world because his arch enemy is gone. And think of how much military spending has happened since then. Don't think of the wars. and the, Just think about it. Like if you were in the business of the military, when we went into Iraq, right? You opened the bottle of champagne with your family and you said, today is the greatest day in the history of our military family because we're going to be buying missiles for the rest of our lives. Cheers to missiles. And if you look at things with the right glasses on, then it's a head shaker. You're like, really? How, how much real estate do you think there is that we can sell? Right. So like the, no, the, no, mil no, the no. military, the no military. Sell. All right. Let's go back to the yeah, budget. But, but here's the thing, right? So like no, the military. Let's go back to balancing the budget. Yeah, I we, love that discussion. We, I, I we've got, about, we've sorry. got like the military stuff, all that. And I think people, um, it, it's hard for them to wrap their head around, but this idea that like the balance sheet of America, there's a lot of, yeah, there's dollars. a lot of people who say, you know what, I, if I was sitting there and I was spending more than I'm making, but I had a bunch of assets, I could sell some of the assets. I could monetize the assets, whatever. Like th th they understand that. Is it a thing where the Department of Interior, we're just going to take away 80% of your offices and we're going to sell them off and uh, now we've got money to pay the okay. deficit or what? All right. So Elon will take between $650 billion and a trillion dollars off our budget. And what's he going to do to do that? Is he just going to fire people or, if, or what? E efficiency, right? We're just, we have offices we don't use. We have mm -hmm. procurement waste at vast scale. And I mean vast scale. I mean, we have- 2.9 million full-time employees, okay? And we have 3 million contractors who are effectively full-time. So we have 5.9 million employees in the U.S. government, all right? That's a lot. And, <laughs> and, oh, my God. And, and so many of them just do, they just give them work to push around paper. So if you actually used computers, you know, they have these cool things now, they computers. You, that can, and you know what's amazing now? They just recently invented, where you don't even need to plug them in. They're mm -hmm. like, they charge overnight and they can use them. So modernize America. You could easily make these people's jobs better, more efficient, and cut 20% of uh, their time waste because they're just moving paper around and ridiculous things. But I think what he's going to do is he's going to cut waste and he's going to cut the size of the government by and save us a trillion dollars. So now we're a trillion left, right? And that comes into my job. Let's talk about how do we make a trillion dollars? If you give us a $500 trillion asset, can you make a trillion dollars off of it? All right. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm going to rename that famous department we just called it. 
We called it the Department of the Interior. Let's give it the real name, the Department of All the Land and Mineral Rights of the United States of America. All the Land and Mineral Rights. It used to be called the U.S. Naval Petroleum Reserve. Now it's called ANWR. 19 million acres off the coast of Alaska that has as much oil, slightly less oil than Saudi Arabia. And it's ours. If we pump that oil, who wants to buy that oil? Let me give you a hint. You know how much oil Korea has? None. And they're our ally. You know how much oil Germany has? They need it. They're our ally. If we sell oil, how about Japan? How much oil does Japan have? None. So it's in, in Alaska. You sell it to our allies. They become strategically important to us. They make a better trade deal with us. They, they thank God for America, right? And we make money. And you know what we do with that money? Reduce our deficit. We use our assets to make money. We have lithium mines. Mine it. Make money from the United States of America. Don't tax our people. Make money instead. Put tariffs on China and make $400 billion. Now let's go to the military. We spend $200 billion a year on R&D. Every year we spend $200 billion on R&D. We take the cool stuff that we invent and then we give it. Give, it's a great word, G-I-V-E. Give it to a military contractor who makes the, the thing we want, the plane or the missile or whatever we come up with that's totally frigging cool. And then they sell it back to us at like a 50% margin. If we simply said to them, you have to give us back our 200 billion on the products. Do you realize I just said 200 billion a year? So you'd say, all right, Howard, you, you got the interior that's probably like 100, 150 billion. You have this uh, 200 billion for R&D that if, if we make a zero return, we are, we're now the dumbest investor in the history of the world. We spend 200 billion and we get our money back. That's 200 billion. Now we're in 300 billion to the plus, right? We're going to put tariffs. Donald Trump said his tariffs would be between 250 and 500 billion, right? And I spend time going on and on and on. You'd say, Howard, you have a, a view with Donald Trump to get to a trillion at the end of four years, don't you? I think it can happen faster. I, I think thanks, that, pal. Yeah, I, I think I think that. Well, here's like here's, I say, I'll get to a no, trillion in four years, no. and you're like, I could do it faster. No, no, Great. no, I, I'm you not do it. I'm, I'm not the even one saying, thought of it. No, I'm not even the one who's who's saying that. Uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I could do it. What, what I think is um, the problem with doing it faster is that you're. It's kind of what Elon faced at Twitter, right? Is he walks in the building and they have thousands of employees, and he says, "All right, I'm going to let some people go," and the second he lets anybody go. The rest of the employees outside of the 500 that are the stars start yelling and screaming. So he's got to make another cut. And what you find is that he's trying to turn the business around while fighting the people who are there because they're entrenched in the bureaucracy. They've got cushy jobs and you know all these issues. In hindsight, I think he reduced that staff by 80%. Yeah, he did. And the product is better today than it was before. Yeah, it's at least the same. For sure. And so if you were unencumbered and you were able to go in, God forbid we did a zero based budget uh, of the government. You could do it way faster. I think that you've got to say four years because they're going to fight you every second well, of the way. But remember there's two sides. There's the cost cutting, which is Doge, mm -hmm. right? And there's revenue production, which is, which is Howard so, and the economic team. So we're going to have a department of the interior person who's going to be the department of land and mines and let's go make money, right? We have our tariffs. Let's go make money. We have our procurement. Let's go all right, and use our R&D to make money. Right? Is there, is, is, I, I think um, if I watch just enough to be dangerous, you talking, Trump talking, JD talking, a couple of others, is there a world where we can eliminate income tax in this country by using tariffs and other means to replace all that tax revenue? Once upon a time, in the land called America. We Don't do the, it. Don't do it. <laughs> we were the richest country on earth, right? The turn of the century. We had no income tax. We had tariffs. We have this great economy. You want to come play here? Pay. 
It's like joining Costco. He's got to pay to come in. It's the best place to be. You should pay to come in, right? And we were the richest country and we had we had commissions on what to spend our money on. Seriously, the United States of America had commissions on what to spend our money on. Then Teddy Roosevelt became the president and he had so much surplus that he built parks and roads and bridges. Remember all that? Okay. Then we had the world wars. And we decided we've got to help the rest of the world rebuild. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop our tariffs. Think of another way to say it is drop our pants. That's another way to say it, right? And let the rest of the world have at it with us. And we'll use the power of our economy to help them out. And we will switch from charging tariffs to charging our gigantically rich Americans income tax. 1% to the 1% to start. And that's where it began, okay? And then you get to World War II, right? And we really need to build the rest of the world. You got to destroy Japan, you got to destroy Germany. And we want to show them democracy is the way to go. So let's, we'll just undress our economy, have at it, come with us, come on, come on. And we, you can put trade barriers up and we won't fight you. So you can put tariffs, you can put trade barriers. You just, we won't sell a car in Europe. And by the way, we don't sell cars in Europe. And you'd say, so it's 2024. When should this policy have ended? 1980? I mean, 75? It can't be 2020. Who says this is great? So if we did tariffs, China would have to pay. Because if they don't use our economy, they can't employ their people. If they can't employ their people, there's going to be a revolution. Do you think that you can put the tariffs high enough to replace 100% of the tax revenue? No. No. But I think what you could do is you could create a world where the business of America is so good that the tax rate can come lower and lower and lower. I think here's, here's a, what I said to Donald Trump. I said, if Elon Musk cuts the expenses enough and we build the revenues the way I've talked about it, Would you please consider dropping all income tax for everybody who makes less than $150,000 in the United States of America? Zero. Zero. And they don't pay, uh, they only pay $10 for any drug. Nothing more expensive. And we, because if we balance the budget, that's about $200 billion. Why wouldn't we do that? And you know what the beauty of Donald Trump is? Because that's a good idea. Okay, you balance the budget, I'll do it. You balance the budget, I'll do it. Because so I don't think, I don't think people understand this. Yeah, I don't think people understand this, right? Is um, tax rates keep going up. And of course, there's local, state, federal. Th- there's a and whole bunch of money, here. by the way. You know, well, Norway. Even, he, even worse, we lose money. So there are people in this country that pay more than 50% of their income. I always joke, you don't start working, for, you don't start working for yourself. <laughs> I, I don't have a special deal with the government. I make money. I pay 55% because I live in the gorgeous state of New York. So you don't start working for yourself until like, July 15th every year, right? Hey, that's pretty good. Day after my birthday. I like it. I like it. But and now I'm going to think about it that way. Yeah. It's right. sad. I mean, it's crazy, right? Six and a half months of the year, you work for the government and then you get to work for yourself for five and a half months. Like, okay. Um, but here, here's what becomes pretty interesting is that um, as that happens, if the government can balance the budget, you can start to drop interest or uh, start to drop the um, uh, tax rate. And to your point, one of the things that I never hear politicians talk about is everyone wants to talk about the rich are taking advantage of the tax system, et cetera. I don't know what the percentage is today, but it's something like 50% of Americans don't pay tax, right? There's some big number, maybe it's 40%, maybe it's 50%, whatever. There's some big number of people who either don't make enough money, the way they make their money, whatever. There's some huge number of people who do not pay tax. And so actually wealthy people, they may pay less in tax than you think they should pay. But the people who pay zero are on the bottom end. Now, I would argue that that's actually a good thing. They're the people with the least amount of money, right? They don't have enough money to pay the taxes. <laughs> so if you, silly, right? if you balance the budget though, you can actually expand that group. So let's just say it was 20% of Americans that they don't pay taxes, whatever the, the number is. If you get it at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, let's say you get 80% of Americans who don't pay taxes. I actually think that the top 20% we say, you know what? We got a balanced budget. You're going to bring my tax rate down anyways. That's a great deal. Let's keep going. Just get my tax rate down. Most wealthy people I know don't look at what is everybody else paying. 
They just want to know, how do you get my tax rate down? And it's because they want a more efficient government, which actually has a surplus, not a deficit. There were, there were two theories kicking around. Uh, I haven't studied them. Um, one says, eliminate all tax in America, all, all tax, and just do a um, uh, the equivalent of like Europe has a VAT, value yeah. added tax, right? And just, so it's a consumption tax. You want to spend money, you want to do something. So the rich will spend way more money. Mm-hmm. But what would happen is the cost of employing people in America would go down, right? Because there's no tax, right? And then and then you'd have a sort of a, a another model where if you earn a certain amount of money, you get uh, relief from the VAT tax, right? That's That's the idea of the model. And what happens is if I want to buy something, it's just much more expensive, but I don't pay any tax. So why not? And what happens is, because we have the greatest economy in the world, all the money in the world flocks here because there's no capital gains tax. Mm-hmm. All factories get built here. Mm-hmm. All our people get employed and they're, they get paid more and more money because there's no tax on them. So they, they're willing to work for a lower price, but then everybody gets employed and it goes up and the, the whole economy becomes the envy of the world. And no one else can do it because it doesn't matter what else, you know, what some country does, you know, which has got the greatest economy, us. So that's one model. The other model was a um, a transaction tax mm-hmm. that you pay uh, I don't know, 1% on anything you do. So you buy a house, you pay 1%, you pay this for 1%, you pay that for 1%, you pay 1% on everything, everything everybody does. And, uh, I, you know, I haven't studied it, but that would earn us money and we could get rid of the income tax. But the concept of these things is only relevant if you actually look at the power that is America. Mm-hmm. And what we do is we sit there and we say, hold, take your right hand, grab your right ankle, pull it back behind your butt and let's run. And that's what the America is that we know today. We don't use our land. We don't use our minerals. We don't use our R&D. We don't use our economy, which people should be paying to come in here. We don't just use the power of the United States of America Incorporated. If you think about it, if you said to me, Howard, if you brought together the greatest business people in the world, and by the way, I run Trump Vance Transition, and I promise you, if he gets elected, you will see the greatest group of executives ever to walk on the field of an administration are going to walk on because of this conversation. Let's go out and make America great and not like some hat. I mean, this is the United States of America. I mean, if we can't make a trillion dollars a year, come on, right? And you get people to start dreaming about it. We will build a sovereign wealth fund. Because if I do R&D, the US government does R&D, right? And we give a company, we buy product for a company with something we invent. We'd say, I'd like 25% of the equity of the company. You'd say, is that legal? Oh yeah, 1947 Supreme Court case, the United States can take equity. Why don't we? We're, we're silly. Silly is a good word, I think. I take we're that very 20, silly. <laughs> I take that 25% of the equity. What do we do with it? Put it in social security. You say, oh shit. You start doing that, then the economy of the United States of America and the success of our companies, they'll pay the social security. Right. And all of a sudden our social security deficit, which we all go, oh, we have to stop paying, you know, have to make the retirement age older. We have to do all these things that no one who's running for office is ever going to do. And all you're going to do is just piss off everybody who gets the money. How about we use our brain to solve it? Well, the, the, so- the social security thing is hilarious. I mean, it is 100% a Ponzi scheme at the moment, but we got here because we were bad at investing. No, we right? don't invest. No, no, that's what I'm saying. We were bad at investing. If somebody gives you money today and they say, I need it back in 40 or 50 years and I'm going to need, you know, X percent return on that money, you just got to make more money than what you're going to have to pay out. Just be an insurance company. But we didn't do that. Instead, what we started to do is- spend the money. (laughs) Come on, we had fun. But if we do it this way, we will balance social securities. We'll just balance it. I actually wonder if- um, You never heard it before because this is a Donald Trump thing. Yeah, one one of the things that- um, I think uh, young people specifically uh, seem to um, be trying to wrestle with is uh, patriotism and this idea that um, doing things in the country should also be good for the country. And so um, 
you know, could you convince entrepreneurs where you say, listen, if you build a company in America, you've got to give 1% of the equity into whatever the social programs are, you know, that sovereign wealth fund, whatever. I don't know if people would do it. I actually don't even know if it's a good idea, but things like that are almost too creative. You can see like a bureaucrat's brain breaking to even try to figure out what something like that would look like. Well, what asking someone to give, right? But if we are, you, you're a contractor and you sell stuff to the US government, huge size. I become the CEO of the US government purchasing incorporated. And I say, gee, you know, I just noticed your entire company is worth me as a client. In, in, in the world I live in, you know what that client says? I'd like to own equity in your company or I'm going to buy from someone else. And you know what you say? Uh, sure. How much do you want? <laughs> right? And, right. What's the deal? If we acted that way and took that equity, so use the power of our $6.5 trillion a year spending, got equity for it and put it into social security, then social security would be paid for. Now you'd say, yeah, but you're just taking money from vendors. No, no, we help the vendor. I'll give you an example. We buy missiles once in a while, right? When we use them, then when we need more, we buy more. But we don't do it. So if you're a contractor and you sell a thousand missiles every now and again, you have a very low multiple on your stock because no one can rely on when, when you're going to make money. So if we said, why don't you give us 20% of your equity and we will buy 250 missiles every single quarter for five years, your stock will double because now you have consistent earnings. It's very clear the math of how you're going to do. So your stock went up 100%. The US government got 20% equity, which it put in Social Security, which now became worth 40, right? It was for free. And everybody wins. Mm -hmm. Nobody lost. Like you realize in that story, I didn't take anything from anybody. I didn't do it. But what we did is instead of just buying when we need it, we bought in a way that our vendor appreciated because their multiple will be higher. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to be really smart. But did you know in the United States of America, do you know how many smart people there are? And you know how many smart people, if you actually talk like this, you know how many phone calls I get, you know, from people who are incredibly thoughtful, incredibly smart, who want to help. And if you give them a chance to help the United States of America, which we love, they all want to do it. It's amazing how many people want to help, but you have to give them the idea. And that is why I love Donald Trump. When did you have these ideas, Howard? Two months ago, I had dinner with Donald Trump and he said, we should have a sovereign wealth fund. And I said, okay, 300,000 citizens, the, the oil gurgles out of the ground. They take care of the citizens. They sell their oil and they buy other people's stuff. That's the Middle East and that's the sovereign wealth fund. What do we got? And he says those magic words that only Donald can say, you'll figure it out. Okay. And then he has all sorts of people call me. And they all call me with their ideas. And we figure out that we can invest $150 billion. And in six years, we'll make a trillion. We'll make 100% return a year for six years. And I said, you know what the problem is? Our deficit will be, you know, 45 trillion. And we'll make 1 trillion once. The United States of America is so big, we don't care. We need to make a trillion a year. And then the thinking clicked and changed. About two weeks after that, I called him up in the morning. I said, I got it. I got it. And, and I started talking like this, that we can use our assets to make a trillion dollars and we can use our wealth fund ideas to fund Social Security, make Social Security an insurance company with the most powerful ally ever, the United States of America Incorporated. All, I mean, come on, all the land of America, all the mineral rights of America. Wow. Our, all our patents, oh my God, the power of us is so awesome. But if we force the greatest athlete in the world to hold with their right hand, their right ankle, and hold it by their butt, they're not that fast. But if you let him, if you take his hand away, right? Elon Musk said, if we cut the shackles, so he texted me after I put the, I put, we put a tweet out together that said, uh, we're going to rip the waste out of, um, 
out of the government 6.5 trillion and and then he he texted me that uh we're going to cut the shackles of America like Gulliver right and and I sent him back a picture of the world's biggest scissor right cuz I'm trying to like be like a cool meme guy even though I'm not I'm like pathetic so sorry I can't do it and he sent me back of course a sword which I was like, fair enough. So much better. Like just so much better. So speaking of <laughs> speaking of swords and scissors, um, Bitcoin is something that you've become very excited about. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are looking and saying, wait a second, all these dollars, all this tax talk, all this uh, national debt, it all just guarantees the dollar is going to lose value over time. We're going to continue to lose value in the dollar. This Bitcoin thing is the opposite it continues to appreciate its purchasing power over time. Why are you so excited about this? Today's episode is brought to you by Gemini. Gemini is a fantastic platform. How do I know? Because I've used it for years. These guys get it. They right now have a special offer where they are offering all eligible new users the opportunity to earn $100 in Bitcoin. That's right, 100 big ones. They're going to get out in Bitcoin if you go and you trade $1,000 in crypto within the first 30 days of signing up. What is Gemini? Gemini builds crypto products that are simple, elegant, and secure. Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, the billionaire Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, founded Gemini in 2014 with a security-first mentality and ethos of asking for permission, not forgiveness. They've been pioneers for the crypto industry since day one. And unlike many exchanges, they are available in all 50 U.S. states. Gemini has tools for new and advanced traders. They've got an advanced trading platform called Active Trader, which is where crypto traders go for advanced charting tools, access to over 300 crypto trading pairs, and multiple order types to trade the way you want. Head over to Gemini.com slash partners slash pomp and start trading with Gemini today to earn $100 in Bitcoin. That's right. Gemini will give you $100 in Bitcoin. If you head over to Gemini.com slash partners slash pomp and you trade $1,000 in crypto within the first 30 days. Okay. So I, I think about it differently, but we get to the same outcome. Okay. Okay. So let's think about it differently. So people use Bitcoin and they say it's a, it's like a currency. It's not. I don't it's, think it is. It is not a currency. It is a commodity, like gold, like oil, right? We don't know how much, but in the end, that's why they call it mining. It's not like that funny, actually, right? And they have a gas fee, right? Like of all the words that everybody uses with respect to Bitcoin are really commodity-based, so they, it should be regulated like a commodity because it is a commodity. And Bitcoin, and let, let's only talk about Bitcoin, right? It's a commodity, right? Commodities, you can sell oil to anybody you want, anytime you want, without regulatory anything. If you want to do an oil futures contract, okay, fine. But if I just like have oil come out of my, uh, my you know, or out of my, uh, I have a drill, um, an oil well in Texas and I want to sell my oil, the government just do it clean and that kind of stuff. But I could sell oil. I can, I can mine gold and sell gold. I should be able to mine Bitcoin and sell Bitcoin. To who? Anyone. Anyone where? Anyone ever. It's just a commodity. So if everyone started talking about Bitcoin being a commodity, they would actually be talking about the freedom of Bitcoin and they'd be talking to people and everybody who's in power would now understand. Because when they think, oh, it's going to replace the dollar the way you talked about it. You know. I don't know. Well, but hold on. I don't think it's going to replace the dollar. Actually, this is something I've changed my mind on over the last three or four years is uh, early on. I think people looked at it as Bitcoin has to uh, to be successful. The dollar will suffer. What we've seen, uh, which was not really a thing five years ago, is that actually Bitcoin continues to grow in value you know, trillion plus uh, dollar asset now, but stable coins have also grown in value. And so now what you're starting to see is uh, the framework that I use is that Bitcoin is like your digital savings account. You put your money in there, you don't touch it, right? It's like gold. You, you buy it and you hold it. The whole point is not to spend it. You're disincentivized in America. You get taxed if you spend it right now and you're giving up future appreciation. So it is that commodity. You sit there and you just hold it. I don't, I, it's stable coins are like your checking it's, account. Okay. 
stable coins are your checking account. They're not like your checking account, right? So in America, I have my money in JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I have a Bank of America. I have Bank of America and JP Morgan. I have checking accounts. They don't pay me interest. Yep. Okay. And I Venmo you. I can PayPal you. I can write a check to you, right? I can use my credit card. I have dollars in my pocket. Who cares? Dollars are our fiat currency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Snap my fingers. You and I transport to Argentina. Now I look in my pocket. I have Argentinian pesos. My savings account's in pesos. The only bank account I can have is in pesos. Pesos going down only 70% last year. We're screwed. I can't have a savings account. I need to get out. I need to get out. What do I want? I, I want a, a checking account in dollars. I go to the bank. Say, can I have a checking account in dollars, please? No. There's no currency in the whole wide world that's allowed to operate in someone else's country. They do their own. So you go to Britain, they do the pound. You go to the euro, Right, All the European countries, they only have the euro. So you can't open a dollar-based account in Europe? Of course not. You have to use the euro. So what a stable coin is, is the dollar checking account, right? Because I can pay you in it a mm -hmm. sixty-two, And I, I can get that. Like, I don't need to get a currency, swap the currency, give it to you, try to get change, try to get the dollar. I can just pay you in it. So it's a dollar-based checking account. It's the digital dollar all over the world. So- I'm a fan of it because it's smart. I want to talk about your story because your story, I think, is um, a story of resilience. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when people learn your story as to why you're into Bitcoin, why you want to slash government spending, why somebody like Trump, uh, you, you believe so heavily in what he can do. Um, and there's two parts of the story that I think are probably most important. Um, what's the story of how you became the CEO of Cantor? Because I don't think a lot of young people understand how this happened. All right. So I had a, I had a job. Um, I had a summer job. Uh, Let's go back even further. What's your social security number? What hospital are we? No, I'm joking. Uh, but, but before you explain the Classic job, middle where, class where did you grow up? Classic middle class Long Island. Uh, mom, a teacher, art teacher, dad, a professor. Okay. American historian. So if you grew up uh, in my household, you'd go to the supermarket and something was $8.57. And my dad would say, eight fifty seven, a fantastic year. That was the year that Charlemagne went into France. And you'd be like, great. That's what our face was always the same. You know, dad giving us a lecture on you know, what happened in 1412. You know, he knew, he knew a fact about every year. That's what a historian will do. So it was fun. So I have like, you, every once in a while, you can hit me with a fact and I'll come out with something. You're like, where do you know that from? I'm like, who knows where, you know, my dad sort of drilled it into me when I was young. So teachers, classic middle class. Okay. Nice little house on, you know, the house across the street next door. You'd play in the, in the street and yell car, of get off the road. Right. Same thing. Yep. Get back on. Okay. Fine. So my mom dies when I'm in 11th grade. Okay. Long Island breast cancer. So there's a heat map of cancer uh, on Long Island. It comes from my best friend's father. He owns Matisse Home Heating Oil. And as it turns out, unbeknownst to, to anybody, he's cleaning the heating oil trucks with water and just running the insides out with water and just running it into the water. Kills 10,000 women. Goes to prison. Uh, super fun site. $2 billion to clean his stuff up. My best friend, his father. Unbelievable. But, you know, I didn't know it then. Of course. I know it now. So he, his father actually killed my mother, which is fascinating. So my mom dies in 11th grade, but nobody's life is perfect. I go to Haverford College, small college in, uh, outside of Philadelphia, because uh, my dad's sort of pushing me and they recruit me for D3 tennis. D3, baby. Good enough to enjoy playing tennis on other D3 people. Never playing tennis when we're done with college. That just ain't a thing. Okay. So play other people like me. I was, I was ranked like top 50 on the East. Not bad, but no John McEnroe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I watched them play. <laughs> you know, so I go to, I go to uh, Haverford College. I'm there a week. Unbeknownst to me, my dad has cancer. He doesn't tell me. He goes for his first chemotherapy shot, goes to a local, SAS at hospital on Long Island. We don't have the money. We're not going to like fancy, you know, cancer clinics and stuff like that. Nurse makes a mistake, gives him someone else's dose and kills him. Wow. I'm, in, I'm in college one week. 
So you lose one parent, it's one thing. You lose a second parent, it's like a whole nother thing. Sister's 20, I'm 18, brother's 15, okay? Go to my dad's funeral. My, by the way, my dad gets killed September 12th, 1979. Great time to hang out with me. I'm so much fun in the middle of September. Oh man, that's bad. Go to my dad's funeral, September 15th. My dad's brother comes up to me and says, uh, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? I'm thinking, Thanksgiving? Isn't that like in November? Are you actually inviting me for dinner in November? Aren't you worried about how I'm going to eat like tomorrow? And he said, let me know if you want to come over. Never spoke to him again. Never spoke to him again. Why? They were afraid we'd be sticky. We'd come over, we'd never leave. So my family, my parents' siblings pull away. And they leave me and my sister, my brother, to ourselves. Just the three of us. So we take care of my brother. Haverford calls me. I drop out. Obviously, I'm going to take care of my brother and, uh, and try to figure out how we're going to, like, you know, I try to cook. That was fun. <laughs> I have no idea how to cook. So I'd try to make, like, chicken or a steak. And that, that didn't work out well. Mac and cheese out of a box is, like, rock star, man. Mac and cheese, you just boil it. You got that packet. I can still, as I'm saying it, I can see the silver packet. It's I'm surprised you didn't just stick with like Pop Tarts. Mac and cheese, baby. <laughs> we ate. So I had a I had a nightmare. My my brother was really fast and he ran track. And uh I had a nightmare. And uh he he was running track and he started sweating and little macaroni started coming out because <laughs> every night we'd have mac and cheese. Like every single night, Mac. I was killing my brother with mac and cheese. I was actually Killing him with mac and cheese. So Haverford calls me and says, we'll, uh, we'll take care of it. Please come back. So I make a deal with my sister. I go back to Haverford College. My brother goes to a boarding school right near Haverford. He lives with me on the weekends for one year. Then my sister goes back. She graduates. She goes to grad school. Underachiever, of course. He has JD MBA. So classic underachiever. And, uh, and then my brother will live with my sister. At, in the next year, and he graduated. She went to Syracuse for her JD MBA, her law degree and business degree. And he lived with her. He went to the public high school right by Syracuse. So he graduates from there. And then um, and he goes to Ryder College, which is uh, right near Princeton. So instead of saying he went to Princeton, he went uh, near Princeton. <laughs> but uh, so he went to Ryder College. And um, and then eventually he joined me at uh at Cana Fitzgerald, but the my sister, my brother, and I couldn't be closer as human beings. And we'd been to hell together. You lose one parent, that second parent, it smelled a certain way, felt a certain way. We just no one else around. The way I said it felt like uh, you know, the astronaut when they you see that video of the spacewalk and they're tethered, mm -hmm. right? Cut it. And you'd sort of drift. That's what I felt like. When you lose your parents, you lose your, you know, your foundation. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, I went on with my life. I got a job at uh, Cantor Fitzgerald. How'd you get the job? Classic way. Family friend. Mm -hmm. Family friend introduced me. Um, so I had, it's sort of a funny story. I I, uh, I had this, a family friend gets me a job for, uh, I take a semester off of school and work on Wall Street. But I, I don't know what Wall Street means, I just get a job and a friend of the family gets me a job. So I work for this company and uh, I become the pet of the boss. He, he likes me, I send him ideas and stuff. So I, I become his pet. So the next summer, they offer me a job back. So I go back to the firm and uh, and he's working on a deal to buy a company from Canifer's Show. Just rando, totally rando. So I get to work on that deal as his pet, basically his bag carrier. Is that a mm -hmm. fair caddy yeah. bag carrier? Not important, but there, get him a Diet Coke if he wants one kind of guy, you know, really important. Anyway, so, uh, so Bernie Cantor and his team, they see me and they decide they hate this guy. So I go back to school, Cantor Fitzgerald calls me and says, We'll offer you a job. 
I said, well, I'm going to go work for that guy. Let's make go, we'll pay you double. <laughs> I'm like, cool. So now I'm walking around college. Okay, baby. They love me. I'm the king. I'm going everywhere. I go to Canada show the first day. I'm the king, baby. Getting paid double. These guys love me. They know how great I am. Uh, I say, where do you want me to work? And they keep sending me over there, over there, over there. Finally, they say, you go see the president. I go to the president's office. President says to me, uh, listen, we hate that guy. We know he loves you. So we hired you just to fuck him. Uh, we don't give a shit about you. Get out. I'm like, roadkill. <laughs> like I'm roadkill. I go from like, who's got a bigger ego than me mm -hmm. to I'm the squirrel at the end of the road. I mean, I'm just like, get out. So I've got to, uh, I figure I got 48 hours to figure out how to get a job at <laughs> Fitzgerald or I'm fired. And, and I pissed off the other guy because I didn't take his job. So I'm like between the two toilets. There we go. Mm -hmm. And so I figure out how to get a job at the, uh, in the firm. And, uh, and I figured out because I have no choice, which is like, I go into this giant trading room, try to pick out who's a winner. And I've got to pick out who the winner is. And I go up to, I just pick someone who's got a big mouth, who's like making a lot of noise, who looks like they know what they're doing. And uh, I said, what kind of coffee you like? And went and get him a cup of coffee, you know, I don't, cream or whatever. I, don't, I bring him coffee. And, uh, and then I tried to sit down. And he's like, what are you doing? And I said, listen, I need a job. I'm hired here, but I need a job. And he's like, what does that even mean? You're hired here and you need a job. I'm like, look. I'll get you coffee, I'll get you this and that. And I'm, I'm making this story shorter. But ultimately, he says, you really want a job here? And you willing to get me coffee? You willing to go further? Now, thank God he was a good guy. It wasn't like P. Diddy kind of bullshit. But, <laughs> but he says, will you mow my lawn? And on that Saturday, I went to his house in New Jersey and I mowed his lawn. And in exchange for that, he let me sit down. And so he, he did the right trade. If you're willing to give of yourself like that, mm -hmm. I'll help you. And he did. And so I got a job at Canada Fitzgerald. That's how, so that's my official getting a job. All right, at so, you, so you get the job, you're on the trading floor <laughs> and uh, you eventually become CEO. But I think there's something- When I'm 29. And, and there's a, uh, a whole path here where Bernie Cantor eventually goes blind. Sort of. Well, let's okay. just go a little slower. So, all right. So, because from mowing up, the lawn to 29 as a CEO, there's a, some, something happened. Right. So, I'm 22 when I'm mowing the lawn. All right. Okay. So, then um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a reader, mm -hmm. which means I, I, I really want to read it. And, uh, and so, a friend of mine, when I'm 25 or like 24, at the end of my 24, mentions this, this just crazy idea that. In the 1890s, when the United States was industrializing itself, it gave land, took eminent domain of land across the United States of America, and gave the land, sound familiar? Gave the land to railroads, the brilliantly named Northern Pacific. And now here's the quiz. What was the other one named? Yes, the Southern Pacific, right? And they built two railroads across the, the United States. And... That land was then put in trust and they borrowed against that land, 100 year bonds and 150 year bonds, what we call railroad bonds at the time, in the 1897. By the way, you want to know interest rates? 4%. I'm just saying. When you think, oh, rates are so high. What were they in 1897? Three and 4%. Seriously. So all this land is on the books of this company called Burlington Northern. Okay. So my friend tells me the story. So I do some research. There's 150 million worth of bonds. So I, I do all this work and I walk into Bernie Cantor's office, my nicely strong, arrogant 25 year old self had hair then, just saying. And, uh, and I say, here's the idea. We buy all the bonds. And I found everybody who owns one of these bonds. John Hancock, the insurance company owns them at par from 1897, still owes them. This is 1985 now, 85, 86. We buy the bonds. We do a takeover of the railroad. And I think the land is worth $4 billion. The railroad's only worth $4 billion. We'll buy the railroad. Let's say pay $5 billion for the railroad. Flip out the railroad, keep the land. 
right? We'll, lo- we'll lose a billion in the flip out and we'll have the land for a billion and the land's worth four billion. What do you say? And Bernie Cantor in his powerful, strong voice tells me to fuck off because <laughs> I'm a 25 year old. What kind of idea is this? I should buy a billion, four billion. Like, what are you talking about? Get out. So I pound on him and then he gives me $2 million to invest. Two. So I take his $2 million. Did you tell him uh, there's zeros missing? Yeah, well, <laughs> listen, I, it took me 12 meetings to get the two. So, you know, remember, I'm, I'm 25 doing whatever. So my career is growing quickly because I'm, I'm a good salesman and I'm a good talker. So I'm, going, I'm doing really well. But so I buy $4 million worth of these bonds. Right, because I I borrow two million, I put two million down, I borrow two million, so four million. That you can borrow fifty percent. That's the general rule. That's an easy rule on Wall Street. You can do more than that when you're a pro, but if you're watching the show, you definitely can borrow fifty percent on anything that's a public stock bond. So I buy four million worth. But you know this whole land idea. They know it too. So the CEO of Burlington Northern announces he's going to retire. And he's going to take the land out of this trust that backs these bonds. And he's going to put 300 million in treasuries in for only 150 bonds. So double, just to double super protect it. And they're going to take the land out. But I told you I'm a reader. So I had gone to the library and then they had microfiche, no iPad. You had like, you did this stupid, like you got a, a like a negative and you put it in a light box and you like twisted it like this and you read it on the light box. And, uh, I'm that old, seriously. It's sad when I tell this story. But um, so I knew what it said. And so I hired some cheapo lawyer at my 25-year-old brilliant self, wrote a letter saying you can't take the land and it will sue you. So there's no video. So the general counsel of Burlington Northern calls me, but he doesn't know he's talking to a 25-year-old. And he says, What do you got? I said, I have four million worth of bonds. He says, I'll tell you what, how much did they cost? I said, whatever, I, got, I paid $4 million for him. He goes, all right, I'll give you the $4 million. You keep the bonds, I get the land. Okay, now I invested $2 million. I still got $2 million in debt, and I made $4 million, so I made $2 million profit. I made 100% profit, and I still got the bonds. And that's true for everybody. So I marched into Bernie Kanner's office and said, I made 100% on our money. Double A bonds, taking no risk. Now, do you believe me? And to Bernie Cantor's credit, he buys 5% of Burlington Northern. They split the company in two, Burlington Northern, Burlington Resources. DuPont buys the land for $6 billion, right? The stock goes up, I don't know, two and a half times. Bernie Cantor makes $100 million. He gives me a bonus at the end of that year of? 20 k one million dollars. Oh, okay. One million dollars. Pretty good. So my friends say he makes a hundred million and you only get one. I go, what do you got? <laughs> I got like $12,500 bonus. Like you got something to say to me, right? So let's be clear. Bernie Cantor really likes me now. So fast forward, my business continues to do super well. I'm, I'm a salesman. Okay. But he lets me start my own division now. So I have my own little division and we're rocking. I'm great salesman. Well, he figures that if you lose him $99 million, you just He's break still even, good. right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm doing well. And my income, my ordinary income is doubling every year. So you think I start at, I start at 40 grand, which was double to 20, mm-hmm. right? Then 80, 160, 320. I mean, you know, doubling grows fast. So I'm making uh, millions a year now. And uh, I come up with my next idea, 1988. And, uh, and that's about Pennsylvania banking. Remember, Citigroup was called New York Citibank, okay, because banks were only in state. And then the federal government created these federal charters where you could be a state in every. uh, So each state would make a rule when the outside banks could come in. So Pennsylvania had made a rule that the out-of-state banks would come in in a year. So I went to Bernie Cantor's office and said, they're all coming. So let's buy some shitty bank, which good locations. It's definitely going to get taken over. So we buy this shitty bank called First Pennsylvania at really nice locations, crappy bank, for $6 a share. Uh, Gerard National Bank, one of the big banks in Pennsylvania, starts to buy it just to bulk up for when the outsiders come in, 12 bucks a share. Bank of New York comes in and buys it for 18 bucks a share. 
triples his money. But because this was the second time, this time he didn't buy 100 million. He bought 200 million and he put all his friends into it. So now he makes a ton of dough and he gives me a bonus of $2 million. My friends have the same comment. You only get two? I'm like, seriously, again, like, what do you got? Nothing. And that's how it went. So what happened is, I, I say it this way. The first time I made him 100 million, he liked me. Second time I made him 100 million, he loved me. And the third time I did it, family. <laughs> and I say to my guys right now, you make me 100, 100, and then 100, Thanksgiving. Where do you want to sit? You want to sit next to my mother-in-law? Where do you want to sit? <laughs> Come on over. So that's what happened. We, we became so close because I was his, like his kitchen cabinet. You know, I was his cabinet the way, you know, I, I talked to him. So I talked to Bernie Cannon the way I talked to Donald Trump now. He's the czar, king, and ruler, okay? And now I'm going to get picked on because I'm czar, king, and ruler. I'm just making a comment that he's the boss, right? I'm not the boss, but I have ideas where you listen. And Donald Trump listens. He hears me. The, way, the right way to say it is he hears me. He doesn't always listen to what I say. I mean, he doesn't always do what I say, but he hears me. And that's all you can care because he then listens to lots of people and modifies it. So that's my world. Um, so then I become the... The, the president of the company uh, in, when I'm 29, just, just before I turn 30, because I've made him so much money, he loves me, right? He just loves me. And that's, uh, so he makes me the, the CEO and then we have the 93 bombing. And it was, you know, we lose our office space, right? We don't know if the World Trade Center is gonna become the leaning tower of Pisa, mm -hmm. right? So can't use the space, so we have to work. Nobody dies. But we're like- By 93, you guys are in the World Trade Center. Top of the World Trade. So I'm, Bernie Kanner signs the space in 19, in the 1980s, right? So for $8 a foot, like for dirt cheap. And while I'm like not a kid, mm -hmm. right? So in the 70s, I think he, he, he signed it in, in the late 70s when I was still in high school. So, you know, I go in and we have the most- awesome views ever mm -hmm. like holy moly you look that way and you see the uh, statue of liberty's armpit and you look this way and you see you know manhattan like a postcard it was awesome like early in the morning you'd come mm -hmm. in the clouds would be below you mm -hmm. and the tip of the empire state building is sticking up and there's jack and the beanstalk mm -hmm. i mean literally blue sky tip and it was just magical so you never took it for granted it was so awesome you never took it for granted. And, and the views from my office were the same as, didn't matter which way you looked. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. So we're always there. So then there's the World Trade Center bombing in, in 1993. And uh, it creates unbelievable stress. But what happens is the executives only care about themselves. And remember, I got promoted in 1991. And how, what do I know? Like I leave the CFO as a CFO and the general counsel as the general counsel. Like I just replaced the president of the company. I got promoted and whatever. I'm worried about revenue. Let's go build the company. And, and these guys run the administration. Good for them. Little did I know that they were a team and they hated my fucking guts because I fired. I was the effective reason why their, you know, their leader who promoted them all got fired. So during the 93 coup, during the 93 bombing, they do a coup. And they go to Bernie Cantor. While we're out of our office and we're going through hell, they say him or me. You know, they say he or we all, we all quit. And Bernie Cantor calls me, tells me the story. I go, and? Like, am I gone or are they gone? He goes, fire them all. And that's that. I fire them all. So I'm now clearly in charge of the company. 1993, we moved back to the World Trade Center and all sorts of sway out. And then I make a rule. We're only going to work with people that we like. Only people that we like. So interview, the guy has to have capacity or the woman's got to have capacity. But you're going to spend a huge amount of time with him or her. Make sure that you're kind of person. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I've just been through that. And that's the company. So we all hire everybody. I hired my brother. I hired my best friend, Doug, but everybody does. You would do it. Everybody hires. I say it this way. We all have the same rainbow of friends. 
We have the ones on this side, smart, capable, and thoughtful. And then we have the ones on the other side, make you laugh at a bar, a little crazy, a little wild. Let's hire the ones on this side, please. And then that's the company, right? So Bernie Kiernan dies in 1996. Iris Kanner tries to sell the company. His wife tries to sell the company. Uh, we have a big court case, gets me on the cover of the New York Times, business section, full thing, uh, with partners like these, who needs rivals? Um, I win the case in every way, buy her out. What, what was the argument? The argument was uh, he had 51% of the company and when he died, he left me his votes and his and his second wife, his younger wife, his shares. Okay, and she was saying he wasn't dead yet; he was on life support. And uh, her lawyer made one of the great mistakes of all time: like never ask in a big court case a question you don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. Right. So her lawyer, I'm on the stand at this, and remember, there's this big giant article in the New York Times. So the courtroom is packed, and it said. With business partners like this, who, who needs rivals? rivals? That's a pretty good title. That's pretty good title. Yeah. And there's my picture and her picture and Bernie Kander's picture. Like, I mean, it's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It's all above and below the fold, the whole thing. And so that, I mean, with that ad for the court case, the courtroom Everyone's there. <laughs> and cameras and court, everything's there. So I'm on the stand and her lawyer says, and I, I testify that my power is ephemeral. It's limited. It's just because if he's okay, the power just goes back to him. I, I only have it because he's on life support and he's not well. But if he's fine, it goes back to him. And I just testified to that. And, and her lawyer says, where did you get this stupid, ridiculous, insane? It goes on and on and on and on. You know, where did this come from? This is ridiculous. It's obviously absurd. And then I let him lay it on as much as he and can. And you pulled up the paper. And I said, it's the 25th, a copy of the 25th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And the courtroom went insane. Like erupted, boom. And everyone like screaming and yelling. It was like, just whack. The judge leaps out of his chair. And he storms out of the courtroom. And it's over. I mean, come on. Right? She's trying to sell the company in the 25th Amendment of the United States Constitution since the power is vested with the vice president until the president says, I am the president of the United States. Of course, if he then wakes up and says, and I'm Napoleon too, then you got a whole nother thing. But if he just is getting an operation for appendicitis, he comes back and when he feels fine, he says, I'm the president. And the power just automatically goes to him. So, so I bought her out. And that was the model. Do people know for how much? Is that a public number? Mm. Why don't you just tell us anyways? It's like 120 million bucks. Okay. And how big was the firm at the time? Uh, much, much smaller. But I thought in the end, uh, that's how I became a billionaire. But that, how did that but, transaction was it? I but, mean, it was, but how did you get $120 million to buy her out? I, I had to borrow it. Yeah. I had to go into debt in a crazy amount. But, but you, you bet know, on yourself. I did. I bet, I bet on myself. And, and I had a, um, I had like a six day old baby, mm -hmm. six days old. And so it doesn't like compound in risk. And I held him up. <laughs> and when I bought the company, I held my baby up like Simba. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, cut him. You know, like, and I yeah, said, yeah. and I look at my little kid, I go, you have no idea what a good day you just had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because cause before that, it, it was my company to run but when I died, you know, she ran it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was her will that would yep. provide. Yeah, but yeah. now I had bought her out and now, you know, it was my family's company. Yep. So that's 1996. Okay. Okay. And then, so we're only hiring people that we like. We're only hiring our friends. I own the company. I'm putting all my money into the company. The company's incredibly successful. It's killing it. We are growing fast and furious. I'm hiring all the talent in the world. We're making a million a day. That's a lot. 2000. A lot. I'm a super rich guy. I have the famous hundred million dollars set aside just in case, like super rich, super rich. And the rest of my money, just feed the beast, feed the beast, golden goose, feed the golden goose. Canna Fitzgerald has no debt. 
Howard Lutnick has no debt. Well, I make a lot of money. Why would I need debt? Right? No debt. Rock star company winning in every way on the top of the World Trade Center have expanded and expanded and expanded. 101st to the 105th floors of the World Trade Center. Right? September 11th. I've heard all my friends. My brother works there. My best friend Doug works there. My roommate from college, his brother works there. My other best friend, his brother-in-law works there. And my other best friend, his brother-in-law works there. I turned 40 that summer. So before then, it's April of 2001. I'm going to turn 40 during the summer. I declare victory. I win in life. I'm making all the money in the world. It's my company. I work with all my friends and they work with all their friends. Everybody works with their friends. Okay. I win. I take each of my senior executives, six of them, out to dinner alone, each one alone. I get up from my table. I walk around the other side and I kiss them. I tell them I love them. I said, but I win. So here's, and I give them each, I don't know, 20, 25 million bucks worth of stock. I said, I win. So here's the way it's going to go. Every day my kids are out of school. I'm out. I'm going to live my life with my kids. When they're in, I'm in. Same as I always am, but I'm just going to be out way more often. You guys are great. Here's a stock. I give them mine. Okay, that's April. I have my birthday party that summer. About 65 couples at my birthday party. So my 40th birthday. So your 40th birthday, 120 people come. Yeah, yeah, 120, 130 people. It's a nice party. And, uh, and then September 11, uh, it's July. July 14th is my birthday. And uh, three months later, 20 people are at my party get killed. So my friends, my brother gets killed, my best friend Doug gets killed. All those people I listed before, they all get killed. We employ 50 sets of brothers and we lose you know, more than a dozen brothers, meaning mom loses two, two sons. I have, I have one father, he lost two daughters because they work together. And 658 people out of nine, I have 960 in New York, 658 people get killed. 658 people get killed. Why not all 900? Whoever wasn't in the office. So every single person who was in the office gets killed. There's no way out. Mm -hmm. I am here because I'm taking that oldest boy who I held up. First day of kindergarten. Five years old. Mm -hmm. Kindergarten, new school. Called Horse Man. 90th Street. First day is September 12th. My best friend, Doug, his son's first day. Not my first day is September 11th, so I'm not there. His kid's first day, September 12th. Mm -hmm. If I had gone to, by the way, and he pushed me to try to go to that school called Riverdale, which is you know, a great school. But I, for whatever reason, I chose Horace Mann, and that choice saved my life because his school started the 12th, later. so he was on in the 11th, mm -hmm. and, he, and he got killed. He was planning to take the next day off. He had to take his kid to school. So I'm at the school. And those days when you took a picture, mm -hmm. uh, when you developed the picture, um, it often had the timestamp in the lower right-hand corner and like an LED display, like your mm -hmm. LED clock. And I have a, that picture is 846 of me and my boy, him wearing his like little backpack with his little hair right in front of the school, right? I have that picture. And, uh, and then I go up in the school and, and then they tell me a plane hit the building. But I think it's like a Piper Cub or something. So I get in the car and I drive. I tell my driver, uh, you know, let's go to Fifth Avenue because that's the soonest place where you can see the tower. I mean, I've been working there my whole life. And I know uh, I know the building by heart. And uh, I, I see just fire and smoke just pouring out of my tower, the one with the antenna on the top. So I'm on the top floors. And my driver starts crying. And now he starts crying hysterically. I go, let's just get there. Let's just get there. We have to get there. We have to get there. He's a retired police officer, detective. So he uses his badge and we get all the way to the building. And I get out of my car and I go to the door. Um, and it's the door on Church Street, you know, on this side. And, and I'm grabbing people, asking them what floor they're on. I just keep grabbing them. Because I know there's like 20 doors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if I get one coming out of this door, then they're pouring out of all the doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I have everyone yelling out, 
the floors and people didn't have anybody standing around. They had no idea what to do. So they were all yelling out the floors and the highest floor I got to was 92nd floor. And then, uh, and then I hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. Now I haven't seen this. Remember, there's no video. There's mm -hmm. no time. I got a flip phone at the time. That's so, um, I start running. I'm dressed like this suit and tie shoes on. I'm running my ass off I'm running as hard as I friggin' can from what? I don't know. I look over my shoulder, tornadoes chasing me. Remember that black mm -hmm. cloud? You guys have seen mm -hmm. the video? So I'm running, I'm running all my might. Now I've, I've gone from a sunny day in New York City mm -hmm. with a blue sky to har film. I'm in a suit, in a har film, and we all know how the guy in the suit with the har film works out. So it's not a pretty sight. So I'm running, the tornado's coming. I see it coming from the right. So I dive under a car. Oops. And then whoosh, all black. The world's black. My eyes are open. It's black. I think to myself, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. This is dead. I mean, it's black and silent. So I go like this. Fah! And I stab myself in the eyes. And it hurts. So then I figure, okay, I'm not dead. I'm blind and deaf. I'm not blind and deaf, but I'm alive. So I get up, but of course I'm hiding under a car and I slam my head like so hard, you know, and now I'm, now I feel the blood like running down my face. So I like, I climb out and I stand up and then I start to run. But of course it's pitch black. So what do you think I run into? Park car. <laughs> just hammer into some park car. I'm like running in the pitch black and I just run into some park car. So I, I hit the right quarter panel of things, go flying over the hood, smash them. So now I'm like, now, now I'm like, I get up on the ground. I'm like, I'm bleeding. I'm limping, all self-imposed, right? This is all just happened to me. And I'm walking in the darkness away from the World Trade Center. And so I just, I just walk. And, uh, and eventually, you know, the black turns to gray and you can see it, it literally drops down. And, and the event of course, was the collapse of two world trade center. If one world trade center collapse, I don't tell the story. If I run that way, I die. If I run that way, I die. I just ran this way. My driver ran that way too, but I, I didn't see him. I just found him a half hour later. He, he found me and, uh, and we walked uptown till people were clean. And then, so there's this line on a payphone. And, uh, and this woman's talking on the phone. So I go up to the front of the line. And I, you know, remember, I'm, I, I'm like covered. Like, it looks like I was flushed down some uh, chimney a bunch of times. Plus, I'm bleeding down my face and limping. And like, I'm like, a, I am a horror movie, but now I'm like the character in the yeah, horror yeah, movie yeah. instead of... So I just hang up the phone from her and I take the cradle out of her hand and she turns around to me and starts cursing at me. And then she looks at me and goes, backs away. And I call my wife. It's been like two hours. I call her and she hears my voice and she makes this noise that I'll never forget. And because she said when she was watching on TV, when the, when the Trade Center collapsed, she knew I'd be in the building. She knew I'd be there. And so she said when that collapsed, she fell to the ground and she thought I died. And it was two hours. So when I called her, she made this noise, you know, cause she, she understood what it was mm -hmm. that people died. And then, and then I told her everybody's dead. It was in the building. Cause I, I felt I was suffocating to death outside. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't buy this whole rescue recovery stuff for my people who are up a quarter mile. So, yeah, nobody survived. Nobody survived. So the only people who lived were either in the lobby. Mm -hmm. So think of my, my, my lawyer, my general counsel. He was in the elevator going up from one to 78 was like a speed elevator, big speed elevator. And then you switched and you had mm -hmm. a sky lobby and you switched. So he's in the big elevator, plane hits the building. 
elevators uh, don't collapse. They have like a mechanical arm that goes out like this and slows it down and rolls it down. And then the doors open. He goes running out of the elevator. Fireball from the gas falling down, explodes through the lobby. Fireball goes across the front of the elevator. He's running out. Fireball runs out. Glass goes flying by. He steps out, gets covered in blood. So think about it. He stepped out between the glass and the blood. He gets splattered with blood. So I call my wife. I'm talking to my wife. She says, uh, Stephen is alive. And he lives in the village. So, all right. so I walk to the village. Wow. Oh, okay, well. So I walk. I, I go to his apartment. I ring, I ring the bell. He answers the door. He's covered in blood. This is like three hours after the attack. Mm. So the guy's covered in blood. So I grab my, you all right? You're right? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Whose blood is it? He goes, I don't know. He's in his apartment. He could wash his face. But he's so in shock. He's, he's just wandering around. And, uh, and then the, there's the TV, and I look on the TV, and I see the giant plane at the building for the first time. And so, you know, that day I lost, uh, I lost everybody in the office, 658 spectacular human beings um, out of 960. And the only reason the other people didn't die is because they weren't at work yet. They were. So if you think about it, on Wall Street, the show is on at about, you know, 7.15, 7.30 latest. Mm -hmm. So everybody who's a money maker is in. So who comes in like after 8.45? Finance department, compliance department, legal department. You know, all the support staff comes in later. But all the talent of revenue comes in when the show's on, mm -hmm. right? So I lost... Everybody made money in New York. And we were a hub and spoke, you know, and the hub is obliterated from the face of the earth. So the challenge of survival becomes infinite because everybody who's alive thinks they're still going to get paid and there is no revenue. It's gone. It's gone. So I, um, I try to figure out what to do. And remember, these 658 people, these are my colleagues. and They're my coworkers, but they're my friends. And they're everybody's friends. Everybody who survived, best friend, college roommate, brother-in-law, everybody had that relationship. It wasn't one big happy family. It was like, you know, and... Uh, So we've got to take care of their families. We, we, we have to. But how? I can't, I can't. We have no money. We went from making a million a day to losing a million a day in like that. Right? Because all these people are alive. You got to pay them. You know, all the other offices around the world, you got to pay them. Got to pay rent everywhere else. Got to pay them. What money? No money. So... We come up with our plan. We'll try to rebuild the company and we'll give 25% of our profits to the families. But Pay you came up with this plan, just real quick. You came up with this plan that night, right? Didn't you do a phone well, call with the employees that were remained that night? So I, I, don't, I don't know. It was probably the 12th at night because um, I doubt I was capable of doing anything the 11th at night, but I can't remember. Um, and we did a phone call of everybody at the firm and we put it out on the news. If you work at Canada Fitzgerald, call this number. Because like we have no HR department. I have mm -hmm. no one's phone number. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. You know, but the women, they, you know, they went to their mother's house when their husband gets killed. You go to your mother's house. So I'm, I'm never gonna find them. Mm -hmm. Um I, I get everyone on the phone and say, we have two choices. We can shut the firm down and go to our friends' funerals. Because there's gonna be 20 funerals a day every day for 35 straight days. Like 35 straight days. Like I couldn't even go to my friend's funerals because they would be literally my best friend from college's brother and my other best friend's brother-in-law were buried, had their funeral in different funeral homes 
one in Westchester and one in Manhattan at the exact same second. So I went to one and my wife went to one. I couldn't even go to my friend's funeral. I mean, how horrible is that? So, you know, we, we decided, or we'll go back to work and we'll have to work harder than we've ever worked before in our lives. But we got to do it to take care of their families. And so we decided we would give 25% of our profits to the families. Um, we'd pay for their health care for 10 years. And I promised them all it would be at least 100000 a family. Because if I didn't make enough profits in five years, I'll work for the rest of my life for it. Mm -hmm. And so we announced that. And a weird thing happens. The media, which had said lovely things about us, you know, trying to rebuild the company, trying to take care of the families. And we had the mass murder of 658 people who worked for us. They say, because a guy who looks like me can't be a human being, can't actually cry, can't actually be a person. Just, you're not allowed. So he must be lying. He's crying crocodile tears. The murder of my brother, my best friend, all, all my surrounding people and all the people I hired is insufficient to get a guy who wears a suit to cry. So I'm crying crocodile tears because I'm giving 25% of our profits. But of course, there's never going to be any profits. So 25% of nothing is nothing. Bill O'Reilly, every night, death threats, calling me names. Rosie O'Donnell, calling me names. Everybody's calling me names. I, all I did was have everyone around me get killed. And I tried to help them. But you know, the media builds you up and then they whack you down. And so, but we have a different idea. We have 25% of our payroll. All my employees who we hire, we say, look, we got to take care of the families. So if I'm trying to hire you for 200 grand, I can only pay 150. But we're going to take 50 grand and we're going to send them to the families. So every two weeks, we're going to just send the money. We're just going to send the money. You know, I think we send it every month. We just send the money. And uh, we just send the money. And then, Three of four people who we hired said yes. And the one out of four, they just didn't take the job. It was okay. Like, if that's not your gig, don't come. So everybody who comes, think of how awesome they are. They're giving 25% of their pay to someone they don't even know. Because I ask them to. I mean, they're, this, is, this is a story of a miracle. I have another story. My uh, So we have a big... We have a big memorial in Central Park. Um, Rudy Giuliani comes. He comes on the backstage, comes up on the stage, and there's 5,000 people there because 658 people have husbands, wives, sons and daughters, friends, cousins. They don't know. He walks out. He comes up to my ear. He goes, who the fuck are all these people? Because he thought he was like going to some little, you know, and uh, so we have this big memorial in my L.A. office my most productive office in the hub and spoke, right? LA, these guys make millions. And now the firm is destroyed. They could easily go across the street, set up shop, work for anybody else. They pay them a fortune to come. And, uh, and I know they're going to leave. So they say to me, um, we're going to close the office. We're coming in for the memorial and we need to see you. So we go to the memorial. And then they say they're going to come over to my apartment. And my, my heart is exploding out of my chest because I know what's going to happen. They're going to come in. They're going to tell me that they're leaving. And then the whole thing's going to unravel and I can't do anything about it. So I walk into my living room. There's 12 of them. And them closing the office is not a good thing. Right? It's not good. They, look, they come in and they surround me and say, we're never leaving. See, this is not, this is not what people do. This is what superhuman people do. This is what heroes do. Get some answer. So they they stayed, and I would. It was on their shoulders. We were able to rebuild the company. Then we hired all these other people, and we uh, we rebuilt the company. The press beat the crap out of us. When did it stop? The end of October. I take my hundred million. Remember that hundred million, just in case. Well, I got the hundred million just in case. I sent it to the families. Just give it away. I give it directly to them. I pay them their bonus. 
for 2001. Ken Fitzgerald's not going to pay a bonus. There's no money. It's out of business. It's destroyed. It's ruined. So I send them the money that they would have made had they lived. And I send them my money. And then the media just stops. Because what, what, what do you do with someone who does what they say they're going to do? That's like crazy. The guy actually says what he's going to do after everybody's been murdered. What a shock. So they leave me alone. And then at the end of the year, because now I'm paying the families once a month. I'm sending them money. The employees are, you know, we're going to survive. And the, the business is, you know, surviving. Let's not overdo it. Um, there's no profits, by the way. Because <laughs> if you think about it, you say, well, how are you going to make a profit? The Financial Times, you know, the sort of the orange, pinky newspaper, names me the man of the year. Like, I don't know, Angela Merkel to was another year, you know, like, and then uh, the New York Times writes a multi-thousand word apology to me, um, January 3rd, 2002, basically, the man who did what he said he would do, as if that's a high moral bar. You just do what you say you're going to do. So, the company survives. And then, to end that story for you, so, we do that for five years. We give the families $180 million and pay for their health care for 10 years. So now it's 2008, the financial crisis is going on, but, but we avoid it. We understand it. I see it coming. We avoid it and, and we're, we're making real money. So one of our divisions is now strong enough to take and go public. It's called BGC. I named it after Bernie Cantor's initials. Um, B. Gerald Cantor, Bernard Gerald Cantor. Um, still public. It's worth about 5 billion now. And, uh, it's strong enough to take it public. And so we do an IPO, but a, but a very different kind of IPO. So it pages and pages of selling shareholders. So what I do is I take my shares and I pay all the employees back who donated. Remember that employee who gave 50 grand? Then the next year they got a raise. So they paid 55 and then they paid 60 and then they paid 65 and they paid 70. And they gave, I don't know, $300,000 over those five years to the families. They don't even know them. How great is that person? How am I supposed to go on with my life and be a rich guy when I have these people who gave so much? So I give them, at the IPO, we sell about $180 million worth of shares and I give them back all their money, which was not the deal. They didn't expect it. And then I give them on top of that. So I sell my shares and give them the money. And then I give them all another $180 million worth of shares. So they should have, I can say thank you. So they doubled their money. So their generosity doubled their money. And, uh, and I squared it with them. So I could go on with my life. I could become successful as I have become. And, uh, but I'm square with my employees. And, uh, okay, what's the turnover of the firm? Low. Lowest in the world. What percentage of the company do the employees own of BGC? 30%. Now, they never sell. Mm -hmm. Why? And then I have, it's 20 years later, but I have lots of new people. But the new people, like they go out with the old people and they like get the story of the company. And, and so the company is owned, who works for who? Right, my employees own 30% of the public company. So I work for them, they work for me. So when I go and say like, you know, I go on like, I don't know, CNBC and I say, I've got the best employees, you know, people think, eh, he's just a CEO, it's like platitudes. And uh, no, I, can't even show it. We have the best employees because these are the greatest. See, they stitched my soul back together mm -hmm. on their shoulders with their money. They saved my life. And I am forever indebted to my employees because they are superhuman, spectacular. But so are you. Thank you. Right? It kind of, in that entire story, it takes both sides. Yeah, I don't tell that story too often. It doesn't really, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of my, uh, 
But like, you, if you, if you, you think th- 23 years later, I'm not going to cry. I'm a beast. <laughs> but, but <laughs> I'm not supposed to cry. <laughs> what you have to do, what you have to do is come up with a hundred million dollar idea this week and you'll be okay. The, uh, the, no, but I do think that there is, um, in these stories, you know, one of the interesting things about leadership is like, it is in service to other people. And so you took care of employees and employees took care of you and it kind of nets out positive. And so you get loyalty in both directions because you're just as loyal to them as they are to you. Yeah. So that's, you know, so I have, we have two public companies um, and the employees own 30% of both because one spun off of the other. So all, right. all my employees, they own it. They're, it's cool. It's, it's why I'm religiously in favor of your employees owning your company mm-hmm. because it, you know, I love the idea of I'm the boss and you own the company. So mm-hmm. who works for who? Mm-hmm. Right. Think about it. Let's say I screw all the employees. We're going to pay you all less and all your stock goes up and you get the same exact amount of money back in the afternoon. How dumb could you be? Mm-hmm. Right. You're so aligned mm-hmm. that you all work together. It's, it's how it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I have one last question for you before I let you go. Um, how rich are you and how much of your net worth is in Bitcoin? <laughs> Because if I don't ask you, everyone will be really mad at me. Um, if you took my stake in my public companies, <laughs> which is uh, public, and you did the public math, you'd see a couple of billion dollars. Okay. Okay. And then at least a couple of billion dollars. And then you'd have, uh, you know, what's Canner worth? Yeah, I'm not saying. Okay. But uh, things are good for me. How about that? Is that a nice way to say it? Since Canner owns the stakes and the other companies, it, yeah. it, it's good for me. So, and I have- Like per- uh, the percentage, you don't have to say exact number, but like, uh, how do you think about either you or Cantor? And- I, I don't have a big enough percentage. I probably have, uh, you know, if- No, I, I can't say, because then people can figure out that no, 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 how much I have. I, I would say <laughs> I have hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. Okay, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, exposure to Bitcoin, um, and it will be billions. I was going to say, so next year when you come back and we'll do this again and you'll be a Bitcoin billionaire and, uh, yeah, but you remember that model I told you. So if every time Bitcoin dips, I'm going to be the buyer. Right. Trust me, so, I know why you're all, doing the lending. <laughs> you're it out. Listen, listen, you don't have to uh, explain that one around here. <laughs> so yeah, I got the 50% Bitcoin, I got the Bitcoin lending, but basically what you're going to see is Cana Fitzgerald is going to be the sponsor of Bitcoin into traditional finance. Mm-hmm. And so we will be the leader of it. And I'll pull out this podcast in years to come and say, see, I told you, because no one's going to remember. Of course. right? But all the banks, after we do it, and show people how to do it right, they'll all copy. Mm -hmm. And so the asset of Bitcoin will just, as it becomes more accepted, it will become more valuable. And the whole Bitcoin nation should just call it a commodity, never a currency. Mm -hmm. Just call it a commodity. Because if it's a currency, you're attacking the politicians of the country, Mm -hmm. right? You're Mm -hmm. you're trying to replace my currency with yours. Mm -hmm. But if you say, hey, 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 I'm just oil, I'm just gold. Mm -hmm. I'm just a commodity. Leave me be, right? Then they'll leave you be. And that is true. And it will be why Bitcoin, which is rare and is special, will become ever more rare, as we both know, Mm -hmm. ever more valuable over time. It'll be financed just like gold is, right? Gold is, it's not like super financeable, but it's financeable. Oil, Mm -hmm. it's not super financeable. Mm -hmm. but it's financeable, right? Bitcoin will be financeable. Bitcoin will be way, way, way higher, sometimes lower. You just have to have faith. Ladies and gentlemen, Howard Lutnick. What's up, guys? I hope you're enjoying this episode, but I got a quick message for you. I just released my very first book. It's called How to Live an Extraordinary Life. In this book, there are 65 life lessons that I've picked up over the years. These lessons will teach you about money, investing, relationships, work, health, happiness, and much more. In this book, I wrote letters to each one of my children, and I tried to share those life lessons with them. If you pick up this book, there's three things that I can promise you. The first is that it is very concise. The audio book is only 
only three hours. You can listen to it on a long drive or on a rainy afternoon. The second thing is that you're going to learn something. It's worth the price of admission just for the lessons themselves. And then the third thing is it will make you think more deeply about your life and how you try to live it. So go pick up How to Live an Extraordinary Life today. It's a quick read. It's very impactful. It's very concise. And it would mean the world to me for the support. Go check it out today on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever you buy your books. Hardcover, audiobook, it all works. Thank you so much for the support. And I'd love to hear what you think about the new book.